How you doing, fight fans? EJ Boxing Live here. So this is the um, Caribbean's greatest fighters of the decade. And um, so we're going to start off with Peter Jackson. And, um, you know, I'm just going to go through all the fighters, Jamaican, um, Caribbean, Puerto Rican fighters who have been there. And some of you guys, it's good, you know, get a history lesson on some of these great Caribbean fighters that maybe history's probably forgot. I mean, most historians know who know boxing, but just for you guys out here, it's very good. And all the way up to 20, so we're starting from 18... 1880 to uh 2016 um obviously current now and um yeah man it's, it's a good history lesson so i hope you guys enjoy it and um yeah we're gonna start with peter jackson into this climate stepped peter jackson a cultured british west indian who had won the heavyweight title in australia jackson had admirers as far away as america where abolitionist leader frederick Douglass kept the fighter's picture in his study even the American press held Jackson in high regard. The National Police Gazette, which was the leading sports paper of the late 19th century in the United States, um, was fairly racist paper in many respects, but one of the things that it, that it touted all the time was writing about black fighters and saying that they deserved a chance to compete for titles and so forth. In 1888, Peter Jackson came to America in search of greater fame. After defeating white opponents and winning over white fans, he tried and failed to take on heavyweight champion John L. Sullivan. I will not fight a Negro. I never have and I never shall. With no title at stake, Jackson settled for a match against gentleman Jim Corbett in 1891. The two guys had a lot of respect for each other. Corbett was on a trajectory to fight uh, for a title. Jackson was thinking he was on a trajectory to possibly fight for a title. An interesting thing about Jackson, some people felt that his style against Corbett was somewhat cautious. A lot of people felt that the public would not accept a super aggressive black fighter, especially a super aggressive black fighter beating up a white fighter. After 61 rounds, the bout ended in a draw. Despite Jackson's showing, it was Corbett who would fight for the title and become champion. A frustrated Jackson went to England where he gained a measure of fame by winning the British heavyweight title. In the years to come, he had difficulty finding matches and rarely fought. At the age of 40, Peter Jackson died in Australia, never having fought for the world heavyweight crown. The official cause, I believe, was tuberculosis, but some say that he gave up on life and uh, didn't care and led a rather debilitating existence after the refusal of all these fighters to give him a chance. Look at that. Peter Jackson, the great Peter Jackson from Australia. Um, you know, when he came over to box... Uh, Peter Jackson, was he a black guy? Uh, yes. From Australia? He, yes, he was the Australian was champion. Uh, no, no. Uh, he came, uh, actually, he came off of a plantation, I'm forgetting, where West, he grew West, up. West, he from the West Indies or something? Cool. From, originally West Indies, yes, but okay. um, uh, he was just great. He was tremendous. And what I love about him, yeah. oh my gosh, his story is amazing. I don't want to get off on another tangent, but let me tell you yeah. about him. Mm -hmm. He comes to America, and this is what I love about talking to you. First of all, you're cute, and your accent is absolutely adorable. Okay. How can anybody, you know, that British accent is just amazing. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter Jackson has, you know, the British, or the, the mother tongue mm -hmm. accent. Okay. So here is this man who's uh, I forget his exact height I think he was almost six foot maybe he was six foot but he comes over and he has the perfect physique and he's intelligent and he has the accent of the mother tongue wow. I mean how could you not fall in love with this guy everybody immediately considered him more intelligent than anybody else yeah. and you know I'm sorry Americans when they're around British people and they have that accent they automatically assume they're more intelligent <laughs> so Anyway, Peter Jackson was a big hit. Now, the art community, I love this, the art community is going through this renaissance that I talk about uh, from the early days of uh, the Greek, you know, it's this neoclassical period where everything 
in Greek and Roman is now uh, popular. So the artists, I'm sorry my, my background in writing comes from some of the artists, <laughs> but um, the artists of the day, when Peter Jackson came over, my God, they were so taken with him. Um, you know, he's put on a slab of marble and uh, pictured, and the artists come around naked, by the way, and he's measured with what they call calipers, these little utensils, because the artists were measuring his muscles. They were posing him like the greatest Adonis of all time. And he was this champion. He was more Greek than the Greek statues of old time. Yeah. Now, here's a boxer, and a black boxer, by the way, mm -hmm. at that time, getting this kind of notoriety. I find it very, I find it amazing mm -hmm. that he was considered the best looking man in the world at that time. And he's in his, in his image, it appears in, in newspapers and drawn and, uh, you know, by these artists who considered him, from Washington, D.C., considered him uh, the, the most uh, uh, artistic body of a man that could ever exist. Wow. So now, he was pretty, he was pretty, go on, go ahead, go ahead. This is a Victorian era, mind you. Okay. Now, when you can print that this black man is more appealing and more artistically developed than any other man in the world, I think you have a, for me, I think that period was an opening in race relations that obviously, to a certain extent, got shut down a little bit by the, the white boxers at the time. And that really depresses me because there, I think there was a period of time in race relations in the United States when people were open to the, the beauty of the best man, so, so to speak. But then certainly these John L. Sullivan comes along, he draws the color line, uh, and you know, where really truly, I think in parlance, everyday parlance, where does the color line come from? It's that scratch line in the sand. One That boxer was not going to step over uh, that line to be in the same ring with a black man. And come on, come on, come on, come on. The reason is because I could beat them. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's why. The reason is because they could all beat them and they know they would lose the title, which was so lucrative. And why were the titles in those days so lucrative? Not simply because they carried all this money, $20,000, $15,000, these championship fights, but because they could make more money on the road in um, exhibition exhibitions in theaters at the time. They could make more money than they could in these championship fights. Uh, for example, if you could make $25,000, you could make, I mean, Jim Corbett and all of those men, they made, uh, they could make 70000 on the road. That's a lot of money. Peter Jackson from the tiny Caribbean island of St. Croix was the 1886 heavyweight champion of Australia. By 1901, he had died of consumption in a small West Queensland town. But that is far from the full story of the Shakespearean boxer, Peter Jackson. In 1893, 28 years after the abolition of slavery in the United States, a poster advertised a touring theatrical production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, based upon Harriet Beecher Stowe's wildly popular 19th century novel. At the center of the poster stands the winsome figure of Peter Jackson, only the second black man to play the role of Uncle Tom, hovering in the foreground, incongruous and bare-chested. Jackson came reluctantly to the role and stated he would prefer to have played Othello, a garish bangled one, for he had made a study of Ethiopian and Moorish history. Besides, Jackson was an expert on Shakespearean, carrying with him always the great bard's works from which he regularly quoted verbatim, as well as other respectable literature of the day like Carlyle and Ruskin. Jackson's appearance in Uncle Tom's Cabin was peculiar because he was not in fact born in America, but in the Danish colonial possession of St. Croix in 1860 and had a distinct accent. It was peculiar for another reason. Before the production aired each evening there would be a boxing exhibition held on the same raked stage as a curtain opener, featuring none other than Peter Jackson. 
Jackson would have preferred to be playing Othello Jackson, among his many other colorful vocations and interests, was in actual fact a professional boxer. Sailing across the Pacific and Atlantic for a chance at the world heavyweight boxing title, as Jackson's biographer Bob Peterson noted of the production, this combination of Jackson inhabiting the role of the adroit pugilist dominating an opponent on stage at the beginning of the evening, and later appearing in quiet equanimity as Uncle Tom being whipped was a strange admixture, indeed too much to absorb for one visitor to the show who. Upon seeing Jackson being flogged on stages, Tom jumped out of his seat yelling, Knock him down, Peter. Boxing careers were and remain notoriously short and unstable. So Jackson decided that, like his peers Joe Chowinski, Jim Corbett and John L. Sullivan, dipping into the world of acting was not the worst idea if you wanted to build your profile and earnings. Jackson got the lead role because he was already, in modern parlance, a brand. Read more. The fight for Jack Johnson's presidential pardon takes the stage. The arrival of Jackson in America in 1890, his third trip, caused a sensation, particularly in black American life. When he arrived in St. Louis by train, 500 black people crowded the depot to give him a rapturous welcome. In Louisville, Kentucky, he received a prorious applause from the gallery where the colored men were packed like sardines as and such scenes were repeated in other places like Ogden. Wherever Jackson went he packed houses in Brooklyn, Boston, Chicago, Cincinnati, Washington and so on, different racial mixes, some adoring, some venomous but at all times engaged. In 1892, a group of young black men in Texas, led by Professor Riel Blackshear, set up a sporting outfit known as the Peter Jackson Club, where manly, corporeal pursuits would be availed to the black man. So popular was Jackson that he seemed to fuse black consciousness and compact class snobbery. Frederick Douglass, previously dismissive about the value of forcible black physicality, changed his mind after a visit to Haiti in 1889 and some reflections on the nation's revolutionary leader, Toussaint Louverture. The idea that a black man could be someone of intellect and imposing physicality all seemed to come together for him. And Jackson came to stand in for that ideal, fused as always in the world of boxing and American Jehovah's in the figure of this rugged, adamantine individual. After this Haitian epiphany, Douglas kept a photo of Jackson in his office, stating, Peter is doing a great deal with his fists to solve the Negro question. Indeed so popular was Jackson, says Bob Peterson, that he was approached by some black leaders to lead a separate black state, in other words, kick out the Texans and make a state there. But that had already been tried with Liberia, and besides, Jackson wasn't interested. His ambition was to win the world heavyweight title, although it wasn't always so. Jackson left his native St. Croix in 1878 as a sailor, intending to find his older brother James who had earlier left for New York. But when Peter arrived James had been absorbed by the metropolis and with no accommodation or means of sustenance. Jackson had to continue on as a sailor, the exploitative conditions proved too much, so after touching in at Calcutta and Java, Jackson jumped ship in Sydney Harbor. After working as a lumberjack, fireman, machinist, longshoreman and stoker, Jackson's boxing career got underway when he came to the attention of the famous Sydney boxing figure, Larry Foley. On the evening of a local election in 1880, Foley noticed Jackson fighting off and beating a number of hoodlums down a laneway. Suitably impressed, Foley invited Jackson to come up and see him sometime, which he duly did, fighting practically every night and earning money as a roustabout in Foley's pub, which doubled as a boxing venue. In 1886, Jackson won the Australian heavyweight title and with no one left to fight, left for America for the first time in 1888. Thereafter he would continue traversing the Pacific and Atlantic in pursuit of the world heavyweight title, the UK in 1889, America again in 1890, Australia in 1890, then back to America in 1891. 
After winning the Australian heavyweight title in 1886, he then defeated George Godfrey in California in 1888 to become world colored heavyweight champion. He then challenged UK heavyweight champion Jem Smith, fighting his way across America before embarking for the showdown in 1889. Jackson won after Smith was disqualified for holding. But it wasn't a championship fight so Smith retained the title. The next year in Bruges, Smith lost the title to Paddy Slavin, an Australian boxer who Jackson had taught. In 1892, Jackson beat Slavin but that wasn't a championship fight either, so Jackson never won the British title. This pattern of white heavyweight boxing champions raising the color bar and refusing to put their titles on the line is the enduring theme of Jackson's career. Whether by straightforward race hatred or by evasion a scroll of boxing champions refused to give Jackson an opportunity to contest for the title of world heavyweight champion, a title boxing. Historian Gerald Early has described as being akin to the emperor of masculinity. Jem Smith, Patty Slavin, John L. Sullivan, Jim Corbett, Bob Fitzsimmons, and other taught by Jackson and Jim Jeffries were all heavyweight champions who refused Jackson his opportunity. A fact well attested at the time. By doing so they denied the world the opportunity to witness the first black world heavyweight champion, formally speaking. That title would go to Jack Johnson in Rushcutters Bay in Sydney in 1908. There are few boxing stories that end well and Jackson was no exception. Having been denied a title shot and passed his boxing and acting prime, he took off at age 38 to the Klondike Mines in Canada with Paddy Slavin to provide the gold miners boxing entertainment, where they threw nuggets in the ring. But by then Jackson had contracted consumption. In a bad way, he returned to Australia. But Brisbane was too dank and he deteriorated before he went to Roma, where he died in 1901. Buried in Tuang Cemetery, he has a magnificent monument etched with the words from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, this was a man, Sam Fitzpatrick, a trainer for both Peter Jackson and Jack Johnson, stated that of the two, Jackson was the superior boxer. That Peter Jackson is and also ran in sporting at historical consciousness is a shame given his enormous sweep and talent. Little of that was for want of trying. Wow. Wow, what a story, man. What a thing this man had to endure just to, just to get a shot at the title. He was very articulate as well, man. Um, at the time, he was tall, uh, tall boxer. And... Um, it was just a hard time, man. You, as you saw, as you heard, all the all the champions denied him a shot of the title, and um, arguably, when we talk about um, when people mention the first heavyweight champ, obviously it's um, of this era with gloves. You think of John L. Sullivan, but um, if the time John L. Sullivan when they gave uh, Peter Jackson, I think I think that would have been that man. So affectionately, people say uh, John John L. Sullivan, and obviously um, Jim Corbett. And um, Jim Jeffries and stuff like that, but but Peter Jackson would say Peter Jackson, and 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 Saint John L. Sullivan. That's how it should be, really. And Peter Jackson, Jack Johnson. Hey man, it was hard, man. But playing as the Uncle Tom on thing, that's like, crazy. Getting whipped on stage. That's how the people will probably want to predict him. But but it was acting. But um, they must have played the role pretty good though, because obviously before the show up, he was there beating people up before the show started. I guess it was a way to earn money as at the time. But like all the Australian title, they didn't put it online. The British champion didn't put it on online. Dear oh dear oh dear man, prejudice is crazy man. But anyway, so that's Peter Jackson. We're gonna go on to the next file, alright? DJ Boxing Live here, DJ Boxing Live here. Yeah. 
EJ Boxing Live here. EJ Boxing Live here.